Link TV, connecting you to the world. Link TV is viewer supported. Watch more at linktv.org. Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. 100,000 Palestinians descend on Jerusalem for Ramadan Friday prayers. Violence shatters dreams of an Iraqi family. And the Pentagon warns WikiLeaks over the new release of secret documents. Mosaic World News from the Middle East begins now. قال متحدث باسم هيئة التعاون النووي الروسية اليوم إن روسيا ستبدأ في شحن. A spokesman for the Russian nuclear agency said today that his country will begin loading fuel into the Iranian Bushehr nuclear reactor on August 21st. The source added that loading the reactor with fuel will be a key step for starting the first power plant in the Islamic Republic. Loading the reactor with fuel means that the site becomes a nuclear facility. ويعني شحن مفاعل بشهر بالوقود أنه سيصبح منشأة نووية. ومعنا عبر الهاتف من موسكو المحلل Joining us from Moscow via phone is political analyst Lina Sopanina. Lina, welcome. What prompted Russia to take this step, especially considering that the reactor becomes a nuclear power plant once it's loaded with fuel? Good day. Moscow is ready to deliver on its promises. The Russian government has promised that it will start loading fuel into the Iranian Bushehr nuclear reactor in August. The reactor is expected to become fully operational this coming fall. Moscow is preparing a comprehensive document for nuclear cooperation with Tehran. This means that Moscow is willing to develop other nuclear power plants in Iran. However, the Iranians are not too enthusiastic about the nature of nuclear cooperation with Moscow. No. Russia agreed to load the reactor with fuel. Is this agreement conditional? Yes, it's definitely conditional. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov confirmed that the sanctions against Tehran don't apply to the Boucher power plant. The U.S. has exerted efforts to expand U.N. sanctions to include the Boucher reactor. However, Russian diplomats insisted that the Iranian power plant is a research facility, meaning it's legitimate. In your opinion, will this Russian step stir anger among Western nations? We can't talk about the entire West. Despite their differences, the Russian and American diplomats sought consultations with one another. However, some U.S. politicians, mostly from the right wing, don't want to see any cooperation between Russia and Iran. They will definitely object to this recent agreement. Thank you, Lina Sopanina, a political analyst, for joining us via phone from Moscow. ونتابع إيرانيا فقد نددت الحكومة البريطانية ومنظمة العفو الدولية بالاعتراف. In another development, the British government and Amnesty International have condemned the televised confession of an Iranian woman awaiting execution by stoning for adultery. The source added that Iran is trying to fabricate new charges against the woman. يبدو اتهامات جديدة بالقتل ضد المرأة. Iranian-run TV aired confessions of Sukena Mohammadi Ashtiani, who is awaiting execution for adultery. She appears to implicate herself in the murder of her husband. The stoning verdict has stirred international anger. The British Foreign Ministry said it was horrified by the televised confession, fearing it was given under torture.
About 100,000 Palestinians perform their first Friday prayers of Ramadan in Al-Aqsa Mosque amidst tightened security measures imposed by the Israeli occupation authorities. A large number of occupation soldiers were deployed in the old city, other neighborhoods of occupied Jerusalem, and on border crossings that lead to the city. Shereen Abu Akli reports from Jerusalem. Israel began its aggression on the first Friday of the month of Ramadan. At the Kalandia crossing, which separates Jerusalem from Palestinian cities in the northern parts of the West Bank, occupation forces set up additional cement checkpoints. Stones were thrown at these checkpoints, likely by young people who were hoping to enter the city of Jerusalem. In the morning, groups of people headed to the checkpoints. Here, an Israeli sign indicates which type of people are allowed to pray in Al-Aqsa Mosque, men over the age of 50 and women over the age of 45. Anyone younger is turned away. I've been here since 5 o'clock in the morning. There were a lot of people who were forbidden from entering and were turned away. They are only allowing women over the age of 45 to enter, even if she's one month short from turning 45, she's not allowed. And young people, even children younger than 11 years old, are not allowed to enter. I came at 6 o'clock. Because I'm 43 years old, they won't let me in without a permit. I've been waiting since 5 o'clock. Every year I go only one time to pray. The journey to Jerusalem begins right after the Sahur meal in order to pass the numerous checkpoints. Some people who enter the city have not prayed in Al-Aqsa Mosque in many years because of the siege on Jerusalem. I swear this has been years since I prayed in Jerusalem. This is the first time I've been to Al-Aqsa in years. How do you feel? Very happy. The happiness of those who are seeing the city for the first time in years may make all the trouble that Palestinians go through to reach the Aqsa Mosque worthwhile. The streets around the old city are closed to cars, forcing both the old and young to walk on foot for hours. We are forbidden from reaching the mosque with our car. Even we, the older people walking with canes, are forbidden from using a vehicle, and I can't walk. I've been waiting for an hour, and I'm sweating everywhere, and they forbid us from reaching the mosque. For us, they closed the roads, but they allowed Jews to enter. During Ramadan and the Eid holiday, they completely closed all the roads and forbid us from entering from anywhere. They got us out of the car, and I'm walking with my cane from the Damascus Gate all the way to here, and we're still walking. They won't let us in otherwise, and I'm 80 years old. But the mosque in Jerusalem on such a day is different from any other day. The alleys of the city are all bustling with life, and street vendors are everywhere. And Al-Aqsa Square is filled with worshippers, which is different from the situation in the past, when Palestinians who are non-residents of Jerusalem or Israel were banned from praying here. This is the image of Jerusalem city during Ramadan. It is not important whether the atmosphere is calm or intense here. Through this intensive deployment of forces, Israel is sending a message to the Palestinians that Israel rules the city of Jerusalem and controls controls its life. Shireen Abu Akli, Al Jazeera, occupied Jerusalem. On the occasion of the advent of the first week of the holy month of Ramadan, thousands of Israeli police officers will be spread around the noble sanctuary and the alleys of the old city tomorrow. It was reported that police won't impose any restrictions on the entry of Muslim residents of occupied East Jerusalem into the noble sanctuary. On that note, the city of Jerusalem received the holy month of Ramadan in its Arab garb. This report by Ruba El Mimi. This area is what is left for the Palestinians of occupied Jerusalem to express the city's Arab and Muslim identities that the Israeli occupation is trying to eradicate by any possible means. Every year, Jerusalemites challenge the imprisonment and judification campaigns in order to welcome Ramadan with the available means, such as electric wires and lamps. We are here to prove our Jerusalemite identity during this month, proof that we live in this country and have the right to do so. The neighborhood is lit up and all these scenes here reveal Arab and Muslim traits. This confirms our presence. Young volunteers are decorating Jerusalem's alleys. Each one of them wants to prove that their neighborhood is the most beautiful, efforts that show their commitment and contribution to the city.
الكل ساهم انه تكون هذه الحاره من اجمل الحارات و everyone contributed so this neighborhood would be one of the most beautiful it's a joy and a delight for all the worshippers everyone participated regardless of their age احلى شيء من احلى ما يكون ليطلع معنا هذا الشيء مهم بالنسبه لنا نرسخ المفهوم It's important for us to show that we, the Palestinians, are in constant contact and solidarity, regardless of our religion. Even our Christian brothers, who are a part of us, offer services. Young people have doubled their efforts to add colors and ornaments to Israeli flags planted in areas heavily populated with settlers. So if worshippers were to look up on their way to the noble sanctuary, their view of the sky won't be tainted by the colors of the Israeli flag. We wanted to offer Jerusalem something. This is the least we could do for Jerusalem. The children of Jerusalem are happy with the city's atmosphere. And despite all the tension and pressure on the city, Jerusalemites are proud of the success of their efforts and work. The Palestinians are trying to hold on to these simple festive scenes as much as possible in order to add happiness and joy to the hearts of Jerusalem's visitors, at least during this holy month. May you all have a happy Ramadan. From Occupy Jerusalem, Ruba Al Mimi, Future TV. Turn now to the peace process, and it appears that U.S. Envoy George Mitchell's latest visit to the region has ended in failure. Joining us to discuss the talks is the Prime Minister's spokesman, Mark Regev. Mark, thanks for joining us this evening. My pleasure. Abbas is apparently insisting on holding off on direct talks with Israel until Israel agrees to base those talks on a return to the pre-1967 borders. Israel says, no way. Where do we go from here? I mean, the Palestinians have, for more than a year, been putting off direct negotiations, always putting preconditions on the talks. And to be frank, we could be putting our own preconditions on. We've got a whole series of complaints against the behavior of the Palestinian government. But what we say is, let both parties come to the table, let both parties bring their concerns to the table, and let's negotiate. Ultimately, the only way we're going to reach an agreement, we're going to be able to bridge the gaps, is by talking to each other. And I, I frankly cannot understand the Palestinian decision to refuse to talk and to keep on piling on preconditions. It's not going to help anyone. A new witness account showing the amount of suffering endured by the Iraqi people due to the ongoing military operations and violence in the land of the two rivers has been revealed. A young man, once his 18-member family's lone provider, has suffered injuries that led to quadriplegic paralysis. The victim, who worked as a police officer in Diyala province, was injured in a bomb attack that targeted his patrol car. Ziad Rahman is a victim of a violent crime that took place in the province of Diyala. Not long ago, Officer Rahman was armed on behalf of the Iraqi police. Today, he can't look after his own affairs due to injuries sustained in a bomb attack that targeted his patrol car. Rahman's injuries led to paralysis. His injuries caused him to lose mobility of his limbs. He is the main provider for his 18-member family, along with his brother, who also lost his hand. Our family has 18 members. My brother and I were employed by the Ministry of the Interior. The incident took place two and a half years ago. On the morning of the incident, I took my police car and went on patrol. We came across an intersection where a woman, dressed in a abaya, or cloak, was suspiciously standing at the corner. As soon as we stopped at the intersection, she walked up to our car and blew herself up. I was wounded along with two others. Also, one of my partners was martyred. I've been trying to do everything possible since that day to get better. I underwent surgery. I was diagnosed with quadriplegic paralysis. I spent eight months at the Ibn al Haith hospital. For over two years, I've been trying to help my family, which has 18 members. Tears are being shed to express suppressed feelings amidst poverty and deprivation. 
They are the tears of Rachman's wife, who issued a plea for help. She's asking the authorities to help her family and husband and their two children. Hopefully this will get someone's attention and they will come help us. Only God knows how much we have suffered over the past two years. We had no choice but to sell everything we owned. We can't make ends meet. The children also need money for their school and education. Ziad and his brother were both injured. They are disabled. Their father is also disabled. It seems that Iraqis are sharing the same fate. They have lost their legitimate rights amidst the political polarization of Iraqi officials. The average citizen wonders who the real beneficiary is. For the Baghdad satellite channel, Fadil Zaidi, Diyala. On the ground, medical and security sources have confirmed that four Iraqi police officers were killed and ten others were wounded in clashes with armed assailants in Baghdad. A Ministry of Interior source confirmed that eight of the wounded were police officers, including a major. The source added that the clashes erupted at 2 a.m. and lasted for two hours in the area of Sidiya. The clashes erupted after the gunman stole a car and drove it to a local home in an attempt to prepare it for a bombing. The police raided the suspect's home after the owner of the vehicle reported it stolen. The source added that police recovered the booby-trapped car hidden inside the home. Leaving behind heavy human casualties and substantial property damage, Pakistan's flood water levels started to recede. While water levels receded in the Punjab region, they remain high but below alarming levels in the area of Tuwansa. Amidst fears of an epidemic and the spread of disease, Pakistan has intensified efforts aimed at distributing aid for the nearly 14 million flood-stricken people. During his first visit to the devastated region, Pakistani President Asif Ali Zadari tried to console flood victims, but this has not eased criticism of his government over the way it dealt with the disaster. The flood swept through our villages and ruined our home. We don't have any place to live. This is the only shelter that we could find. In this village, some homes withstood the flood. However, the remaining homes were destroyed by the floods. The government, so far, has not done anything to help. We had rice for dinner, but it wasn't enough. We saved some for Ramadan iftar. We don't have any money. We don't know how to cope with fasting. The U.S. Department of Defense warned WikiLeaks against publishing more classified documents on the war in Afghanistan. The department described the website as irresponsible because it will put the lives of American soldiers in danger if it publishes the more than 15,000 documents that it possesses on the military situation in Afghanistan. يبدو أن ملف تسريبات ويكيليكس لن يغلق سريعا فالموقع الإلكتروني الذي سرب عشرات It seems that the leaking of information by Wikileaks will not end soon. The website which has leaked tens of thousands of classified documents revealing the disasters of the war in Afghanistan will continue to release over 15,000 files on the same subject. The founder of the website, Julian Assange, confirmed the claim despite the criticism directed against him by the U.S. administration. The most recent Criticism came from the U.S. Secretary of Defense, who accused the website of behaving irresponsibly. He said that the website's insistence on revealing more classified documents puts the lives of American soldiers in danger and threatens the lives of a number of people who are behind the leak. But what is surprising is that the organization Journalists Without Borders agreed with the U.S. authorities. The organization directed the same accusation against the website, saying it was being imprudent about the danger of the situation. The files that were leaked last month include Afghanistan's conditions between 2004 and 2010. One of the most prominent facts that it revealed is that a number of unrecorded military operations were carried out and led to the victimization of civilians. In addition, Taliban militants used surface-to-air missiles in their attacks on NATO troops.
Meanwhile, the founder of the website said that he will continue the work in order to unveil many things that have been covered up in the war in Afghanistan. He stressed that U.S. criticism is only aimed at distracting the world's attention from the content of the leaked files. Obama reconfirms his commitment to the Iraq drawdown. But a top Iraqi general says troops won't be ready till 2020. Will the U.S. completely withdraw from Iraq? And what role will American contractors play? Answers to these questions and more on Link TV's Mosaic Intelligence Report. There are remarkably few positive things to say about Iraq today. The country seems to be in perpetual upheaval since the U.S. invasion in 2003. Dozens of people were killed across Iraq just days ahead of the start of the holy month of Ramadan, and more will probably lose their lives in the coming few days when insurgents typically step up their attacks. I transport workers in the morning. They come here looking for work. They are trying to make a living. They don't deserve this. This act is not part of religion. God doesn't condone it. What kind of people are they? Yet the Obama administration has recently announced that the U.S. is on target to end the combat mission. The U.S. government plans to withdraw its combat troops by the end of August and to remove all troops by the end of 2011. The president was satisfied with the progress that we continue to see on the security side. We are on target by the end of the month uh, to end our combat mission, turn over bases, uh, that uh, Americans have been on to, uh, to the Iraqis uh, and transition our role there. But Iraq's most senior military officer, Lieutenant General Babakir Zibari, said that his forces, particularly the Air Force, were not ready to take over, cautioning that his security forces will not be able to secure the country until 2020. The U.S. has 50,000 actual combat troops, but the problem will be after 2011. So we have to work with the Americans, the West, or the regional countries, because the Iraqi army will be ready only in 2020. Once again, Iraqi people are being killed in explosions that shoot a number of... The country has been facing many domestic challenges, such as a period of Sunni Arab insurgency, bloody attacks by al-Qaeda, confrontations with al-Sadr militias and the ongoing tensions between various political factions. However, it's Iraq's vulnerability to neighboring countries that Zibari was alluding to. Meanwhile, in an interview with the British newspaper The Guardian last week, Saddam Hussein's former deputy Tariq Aziz warned about a U.S. withdrawal and accused Barack Obama of leaving Iraq to the wolves. Indeed, and even with the presence of 64,000 U.S. troops in Iraq, both Turkish and Iranian troops have recently crossed Iraq's northern border in pursuit of Kurdish rebels. Last December, Iranian troops occupied an Iraqi oil well in the south, triggering popular outrage but little action from the Iraqi government. It's worth mentioning that not everyone agrees with Zibari. A couple of days before his cautioning statement, General Ali Gaidan, the commander of all Iraqi ground forces, told reporters at a news conference that his troops are 100% ready to take over. The security forces are now ready and will maintain security in the country. We are fully ready to receive all the duties from the American forces during this period and until the end of 2011. We will be responsible for all security matters in Iraq. But will the U.S. actually withdraw from Iraq? Not really. Tens of thousands of U.S. troops will remain in the country to train the Iraqi army and provide it with logistical support. If need be, they would be engaged in combat missions. Meanwhile, the number of private contractors working for the U.S. in Iraq in sectors such as security, communications, utilities, and commerce is estimated at 100,000. This number is likely to increase significantly once the combat forces are gone, especially in the security sector. Move on, U.S. Marines. Here comes Z Services, better known as Blackwater. 
the political stalemate between Nur al-Maliki and Iyad Alawi, if not resolved, might soon trigger a major political upheaval, something that may cause the Iraqi government with its fragile coalitions to collapse. The last thing the Obama administration needs while withdrawing the troops. It took 21 days for the U.S. armed forces to reach Baghdad and topple Saddam Hussein. But leaving Iraq is proving to be more complicated than invading it. I'm Jamal Dejani for the Mosaic Intelligence Report. For more about this program or to share your thoughts, visit us at linktv.org slash me. Stay up to date on the Middle East. Follow Jamal at twitter.com slash Jamal Dajani. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible from support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news. Read our blog. Get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.